Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the April 9th Policy Committee meeting. Let's begin with introductions and administrative remarks. I want to welcome my colleagues Lydia and Chuck here, as well as our student representative, Rachel, and Mrs. McMenamin as our teacher representative. Dr. Stevenson, do you have any administrative remarks for us this evening? Um, good afternoon, and thank you, um, Chairman <coughs> Goldman. Um, we only have, I just wanted to say that um, at each of the committee members' um, desk, you will find um, copies of a revised red line and clean of um, 239 AR and the reason why that was there uh, I, as we go through board docs um, we are trying to refine the procedures and for some reason the printing did not um, sh was not reflective of um, some of the red line um, uh, deletions so that this is a um, to show you that what was changed um, in those um, in those AR guidelines, and so we would be glad to talk about it when we um, get to it if there are any questions. Okay, terrific, thank you. That's first up on our agenda, so we'll talk about it shortly, but in the meantime, I'd like to open up for some public comment, if anybody has any to make tonight. Good evening, Mrs. Dunn. Hi, um, I wanted, <laughs> excuse me, to speak to you all about matters of um, exchange students. We had a really compelling um, statement by Ms. Kevgus in the last, in our curriculum committee meeting that we just were here, about the importance of diversity and inclusion and learning about other cultures. Um, and I, maybe this has been my impression from watching the videos of prior policy meetings and the um, board meeting I had to miss last month. I am concerned that we don't properly put value on an exchange program. Um, I say this as someone who was an exchange student in Argentina. I come from a long line of exchange students. I was a Rotary Scholar. My sister went to Germany. My cousin went to Japan. I have another cousin who went to Taiwan, Thailand, Belgium, and Finland. We have collectively from those travels gathered friends and understandings of cultures far beyond the reaches of Radnor. Um, as a result of those exchanges with other families, my children and I went to a wedding in Tokyo, a, an actual at a Shinto shrine there. Um, we are planning to visit family in Finland over spring break. We have quote unquote family in Brussels. And when my host family from Argentina comes to visit the United States, they call me and small children who look nothing like me call me Tia Sara because I'm family. Um, I think that a knee-jerk reaction to say there's an expense, and I appreciate that there is an expense to English language learning, but a knee-jerk reaction that says we don't want to have to have more than one exchange student without having to go for board approval um, creates for me a feeling that we as a board or we as a community don't value that kind of exchange. And I understand that we have shorter term exchanges. Um, I understand that it's not that we don't have those exchanges, but I think that a policy like that potentially sends a message to people that we aren't interested in nonprofit cultural exchanges. I've read the AR. It's very clear we don't take commercial exchanges, and I think that's great. I think that there, you know, this should be focused specifically on cultural exchange. Um, it's not a for-profit business, but I, I, I don't understand the reason for taking that cap from three, which it sounded like from our solicitor is pretty standard in this area, down to one. I heard one comment in last month's meeting that to have to educate um, an English language learner exchange student would take away from one of our students. Um, I think realistically that's not true. By law, we have to do it, so we're not going to not give English language learning students the education that they deserve. And I think that it potentially creates a message of xenophobia. I, I just, I would hope that you would reconsider the limit of one. Um, I have a lot of problems with, with that. I think it just, I think it sends the wrong message. Um, people around the world were very open to me when I traveled and I would want them to think that, that the community I live in would be open to them as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any, is there any other public comment this evening? Roberta, 
Roberta Winters, 326 Williams Road in Rosemont. I would just like to um, also note that I, have, while I've not been involved in the exchange program, I do know that it has been very helpful to students that I have taught at the elementary level who needed that kind of experience. And I think sometimes there's more involved than English language learning. And I think that it's very important that the number of students that we receive also impacts the number of students that sometimes we can send. And I think by limiting the number of students that we receive, we may also be limiting the opportunities we provide for our own students to be a part of an exchange program. And again, that may have changed over the years, but that was my experience in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, well, I guess that concludes public comment, seeing there are only two folks out there today. So thank you for your comment. And let's do the approval of minutes. Does anybody have any concerns about the minutes? Nope. Okay. So we will move into our first agenda item, which is Policy 239, Foreign Exchange Students. Dr. Stevenson, would you like to make any remarks about this? Um, so this policy has come back to the board. Um, Your microphone, I think. Thank you. Um, this, this policy um, has... Um, come back to the board for the committee for um, consideration for a second read. Um, and the reason why um, what we have asked is that we move forward with um, with this policy um, based on the, the out, what we have outlined. Um, and I'm open to any questions about, um, I didn't know whether you would like the, from the committee to, to have the con the questions that you had earlier that some people had to, to talk about or um, how do you want to guide that? Well, I think we have the um, luxury of Mr. Bechtold here this evening. So if he's willing to join us for this conversation, we can entertain the question that was raised and anything else that the committee has tonight. So before he gets started, let me just do a quick check around the table and see if there's anybody else who has questions about policy 239. Rachel, Mrs. McManaman, Chuck. Well, I'd just like to hear this, the rationale and behind it, and because I think it's a bigger question that I have, and and that's actually about the exchange program that we are, that we offer, and, and and what is that, and what is that like, and do we send kids, and do we get kids? I don't know whether that would be part of this discussion, but I think that's more um, in line with. Um, either limiting or not limiting the number of kids. Do, do we actually have one that works? Do, have we had kids? We did have when I went to school there. We did have one. Many people went there. I'm not sure what it looks like right now. So I, I'm, I'll defer to Mr. Bechtel to talk about what um, the high school's um, program looks like. Uh, we do not have a formal exchange program with a uh, company or nonprofit where we accept so many students and then we send so many students. Um, we've had students that have uh, elected to spend years abroad. Um, maybe two or three years ago we had a student that went to Japan and that's one that stuck, stuck out in my mind as I was sitting back there listening to public comment. Um, anytime we have a student that's interested in studying abroad, we work with the, the parents and the students to help make it as easy as transition as possible, but we do not have a specific formal program with any uh, organization. Um, we do have a UK exchange that we ha have at every year, and that's for uh, about a week or so, um, where the students from the UK come over here to the Radnor High School, um, and they get a chance to see our, uh, what our high school's like and go to some of our classes. Uh, that's typically in the fall. And then in the spring, they reciprocate. And again, it's a short trip. It's um, I don't know the exact length of the trip, but I think both trips are seven to seven days or so, maybe maybe slightly longer. We do have a number of trips that uh, come up intermittently. The board approved uh, one of our clubs to send students to Guatemala this summer. Um, we have trips uh, to Spain that that come and go, um, and uh, and other areas. So, and that's run. Um, again, not on an every year basis. I believe they're going to looking to go to Spain next year with our with our Spanish trip. But um, 
So we don't necessarily have, again, a formal exchange program where we trade students with other schools, um, but we do have opportunities for students to go abroad. Um, the, you know, the, I heard the public comment and I understand the, the value of it. Um, you know, when I was a teacher, uh, I remember having a student that came to the school district from Germany. Um, and I was the wrestling coach at the time, and um, he integrated, and, and it was great. We have a student from Italy this year. Um, so, um, you know, I guess the, <clears throat> the concern that I would have about expanding the, the number of students that would come would be Radnor Township School District is a destination place. Radnor High School is a, a destination high school. With the absence of a formal exchange program, if we open it up and allow 10 students in, we're going to get 10 students. If we open it up and have five students, we're going to get five. Um, I think that we would be much more attractive to students uh, coming overseas just because of the nature of the, the school that we run. Um, we do have um, costs to educate students that, that come. Um, they are, are taking seats in our classroom, um, and ultimately they're competing against Radnor Township residents in athletics positions and musicals and plays and things like that. I think that there's certainly value in having them over, um, but I, I do think that it's a cost to the district, and I think that um, you know the, my concern would be that um, how large that number would get would would really. Um, how much it would actually cost our, our students. Can I just, so, uh, and, and I hear that, and that's basically what I understood the program was. So if, and I think at our last policy meeting we said we may look at breathing a little life back into the uh, exchange. We had, we had a very good fantastic exchange and, and, and it, it must have withered on the vine. I forget who the lady was that ran it. Yeah, Jane Dugdale ran it and um, she left. And unfortunately, sometimes when you have one person runs it and does, she did a fantastic job with it, it just, it just was never picked back up. So um, separate from this piece, the number that we're putting in here, I'd like to kick it over to possibly the curriculum to see whether we would like to revisit that or, or I'll ask the, Ken, uh, Mr. Bachelor, what our next steps might be to look at putting that in place because if the board feels the uh, importance of and it's an exchange program so if we're sending two kids over two students over to other countries their countries are coming to us so although it is a cost the other districts are picking up the cost of our kids and I think it's, uh, it would be extremely valuable. So, but that's just me. And I and I agree with that sentiment. I think that if we would actually have an exchange program right, right. and we'd have the benefit for two of our students that for taking two of their right. students, I, I can totally see that. Um, currently, we don't. We just right. accept. Yes, I agree. I agree. So, so if um, so, I was just conferring with. Um, first of all, thank you, Mr. Bechtel, for your um, comments. Um, I was conferring with a solicitor and the superintendent. And it seems like, um, and part of this that is why it keeps coming back is the number. Um, when um, a solicitor um, recommend this slot is because it was a common practice in the updated version of um, of what what other districts are doing. Like I said, the, the common number that a lot of districts use was three, but we can use any number possible. What the language said before, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that it said the board. Um, may limit the number of foreign exchange students who are admitted yearly, correct? Correct. So it, it is my recommendation um, that, um, uh, that we go back to that language. And the reason why I say that is then that is kind of concurs with what Mr. Madden said, and it answers some of the concerns of some of the board members, both on the committee and the larger board, who are, are, are saying that, you know, feeling that this would, would, would box us in. It doesn't change a lot. What, what it does is it requires the administration, if there is such a program, it gives the authorization to the superintendent or his designee to review it and then bring it back to the board if, if there's a, a, a need for a program. So, for instance, the, um, if there is a, through the curriculum committee or through the administration or through the school, 
that there is a proposal for a a such a program from the school that the board that the administration can authorize that to move forward for recommendation to move it forward, Mr. Bachelor. That's if that's I was just yeah. okay. I'm sorry. I'll say I think some of the you know what changed and not knowing the history here in Radnor, but I'll say that I think what I've seen change over the years with exchange is that the traditional exchange, you know, our students go over there, their students come here or different pieces or that happened um, that were very much district run. A lot of that has been taken over by companies has been my experience, um, you know, in, in other districts is that a lot of this is now there, there's a lot of businesses and companies that we're interacting with when it comes to exchanges. And I think in, in, in from, from that position and that point, I think we want to make sure we're balancing in there in our policy uh, that, we, that there are opportunities for us to have limits because sometimes, you know, looking at the rationale and, and looking at what's going on, we, we want to be able to decide, okay, what is that limit and how do we want to put it? So whether we go back to the previous language, uh, I'm, you know, I can be comfortable with that going back to the previous language. Um, I don't know if Mr. Bechtel did the previous language give, was there concerns in the past with the previous language? I, d I did not have concerns. Okay. Could you refresh for us, Ed? It's a little hard to tell sometimes on the red line in board docs what the previous language is. Could you just, and, and I guess what's happening is that you're just removing the specificity of a number and leaving it entirely open to board discretion as on a case-by-case -case basis as to what foreign, how many foreign exchange students would be accepted at any given time, right? So what, what does that sound like? Correct. So and I have it up on the screen here. This is the current policy, but you'll see towards the top of the screen, it says the board reserves the right to limit the number of foreign exchange students admitted to the schools. So that's the language that's in the current policy. Um, and that's one option is to stick with that language. And then the question uh, that would be for the committee to decide is, um, does the board only get involved if there's too many students that are being admitted to put a limit on it or do all students have to come you know what is the direction to the administration uh, does the superintendent have the authority to admit students so long as he or she is comfortable that there's room in the schools and that the programs can accommodate students or is it that uh, every year the board approves all foreign exchange students so would you say that fleshing out, I assume that's part of an authority <coughs> statement, right? That's the authority section that sentence is in? Correct. So would fleshing out that line to give that direction to the administration about what to do um, help? I think that Like would just be, expanding that sentence? Would, would, could we look at the AR yeah, for that Yeah, that's the piece? other thing. That language could be put in the AR too. Okay. Okay. So well, the, this would be a substantive change. This would need to go back again for a first read. And again, just as a reminder, I know I put this in the cheat sheet for everybody, but the only reason why we're looking at this policy in the first place is because of the, the requirement that came from ESSA about needing to assess and provide services for any exchange students who require English language service, uh, language uh, learning. So. Um, so it's opened it up actually to a bigger conversation and maybe this is the happy medium is just changing the language back to what we originally had because it didn't seem to be a problem in its original form. Um, I would be in favor of that. Um, I would, I think that that would be, I mean to me, I did not expect to, that we would end up there so I'm delighted actually that I, I don't know that we've been swamped with foreign exchange students. I mean, I know we used to have countries that would send them Germany, Japan, or two of the biggies. I don't know that we've had one in the last few years, have we? We ha we currently have one this year. We do. Okay. Mm -hmm. And where are they from? Italy. Okay. But do we send somebody there, though? We typically have about one a year. Okay. So we didn't have that information. So I'm really glad you're here. Because people, I was under the impression that it had kind of waned and that there wasn't really interest in it. So, do you I'm think, Mr. Bechtel, as an administrator, to, not to put you on, is that manageable to go back to the original language from an administrative point of view? I mean, I certainly I, don't I want do. to leave you out of the no, discussion I, here. I'm, I'm in favor of the original language. That works. Okay. okay. All right. Why didn't we think of that sooner? All right. Well, 
thank goodness at least we did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Back to the drawing board for this one. Hopefully this will move us. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. This, so this policy will then be reworded, brought back to us again in May for a first read. Um, and if there is any implication for the AR to give the direction needed to the administration, you'll let us know that. Okay. Um, just as another point of information, um, as Dr. Stevenson said, the administrative regulation, which does not need board approval, is attached and you saw it, but there was a change because, again, with a quirk in board docs, two paragraphs on at the bottom of page one of the administrative regulation should have been redlined, and for whatever reason they weren't. Those paragraphs begin, each one begins with foreign students who, and the other one underneath that, foreign students who. They should have been removed in the AR, and for whatever reason it didn't print out that way. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions about that? Just so they're supposed to be out. Yes, that's why there's the big X through them. The, you're, you're this is what I was given. I was just handed this. So it should have been page one, and you don't have, oh, right here, what about it? Oh, here. Well, well no, wait a minute, just here. Just put an X through it. Oh, there it is, right there. Here's the corrected Underneath. version. So it's out of this one. Now, Lydia, that's this one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so. No, this is what was in your packet. This is what it should be. Mm -hmm. And what's this? Red line. Red yes. Line. There was a little quirk in the red line. We'll get it all figured out in time for next month, promise. But just, you, everybody's good with that. Okay. So. Mr. Bechtold, you're okay with 230 because we're done with 239 for the Sounds month. Sounds great. And if you're comfortable and the committee's comfortable and the public is comfortable, I say it's time to move on to our next agenda item. What does everybody think? Yes? Thank you. Okay. Bechtold, thank, thank you, you so yeah, much for, for staying, your, Mr. Bechtold. Appreciate it. Okay. That will then um, move on to, so that policy is coming back in May. No, no moving on to a first read in, at the end of this month. That brings us to policy 225, which is relations with law enforcement agencies. Um, would Dr. Stevenson or Mr. Diazio like to give us a little background on why we are, aside from the rationale there, any other narrative you want to give us about why we're reviewing this policy? Yep. Sure. So policy 225, uh, as the committee uh, may be aware, uh, the Safe Schools Act in Pennsylvania requires school districts to enter into an MOU with local law enforcement every two years. In the old policy or the existing policy, which was last revised in 2008, there were some guidelines in the policy regarding interrogations of students and arrests of students, which were not exactly consistent with uh, the memorandum of understanding with law enforcement, which has been developed since 2008. So uh, to make this simple, uh, the, the revised policy is a very, very simple uh, statement of policy, and the AR includes a copy of the MOU with law enforcement. So attached to the AR are all of the provisions that are in place between law enforcement and the district. I want to apologize. I jumped to agenda items ahead of myself because I forgot to turn the page. I am so sorry. We can talk. Let's talk about this one since we're on it, and then we'll go back. Sure. Forgive me. So while we're at 225, does anybody have any questions about that policy? Let's start with Rachel. Do you have any questions about 225, Rachel? Yes, I have one. Would you mind just your microphone? I think oh. needs to be. Oh, it's blocked. Okay. Now, now it's Excuse off. Me. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I would just I was just wondering if you could describe an MOU from from in your words. Sure. So an MOU, yeah, it's it stands for Memorandum of Understanding. It's sort of an informal agreement between the district and law enforcement, and it outlines the responsibilities of law enforcement and the responsibilities of the district when certain things take place on school property, generally things that are violations of the code of conduct and sometimes criminal in nature, things like theft, things like sexual assault, those types of things. Um, the MOU outlines what's the role of the school district, what's the role of law enforcement, who conducts the investigation, um, and, and what roles do all the parties play to work together when those types of things take place. 
It's okay. sort of like a contract. Gotcha. All right. Thank you for explaining that. Okay. Mrs. McMenamin. Mr. Madden. I'm good. I just have one question, which is actually unrelated to this, but it's, is, is there normally an NMOU with your fire uh, department? Or what, what, what is the understanding that when they come into our building? I mean, there's not a formal MOU uh, with the fire department, but uh, coordination with the fire department would certainly be part of the emergency management plan and probably the, the district-wide and the school-based mm -hmm. emergency plans. But there could be an MOU there, if there, possible. There's no reason why there can't be. The MOU with law enforcement is required by law. Right, exactly. Okay, all right. Thank you. Lydia, do you have any questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you're, we're changing this policy because it now states we have to do this, according to Safe Schools? We, we, the MOU has to be done. I you said that, but I didn't. Yes. Okay. So the MOU has to be done by okay. law and we're attaching the MOU to the regulation so that everyone can see it. Okay. In the old policy, in the existing policy, there were some guidelines and some uh, topics that were discussed in the policy, but they've now been superseded by the MOU. So we really never had something as formal as this before? No, yes, we We've yeah. had the MOU for several years oh. now, but we've never we've never formally brought the policy forward to do this revision until now. Okay. Sorry, I just couldn't follow. Okay, and I have just want to make sure that we're talking about Act 44 of 2018 that that mandates this. Is the the oh, no. MOU uh, came in, into place before 2018. No, 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 not the MOU, but the fact that we have to incorporate it into this policy is as a is that a re requirement because. The way the rationale reads, it speaks to um, the PEA Safe Schools Act, and I just wanted to make sure, is that the same thing as Act 44 of 2018? No, and there's, there's no requirement in the law that the MOU be incorporated into board policy. It just seems to make sense, given that the district has a policy on coordination with law enforcement, that the MOU with law enforcement be part of that policy. And our policy okay. shouldn't say anything contrary right. to what's in that MOU. That makes sense. But what is the difference between the PA Safe Schools Act and Act 44? I'd have to look at Act, Act 44. Act 44 may have amended pieces of the Safe Schools Act. That, that's my, that my understanding is that Act 44 probably amended the Safe Schools Act, but the Safe Schools Act has been in effect before Because that Act 44 is the PA Schools Safety and Security Act. Right. So if there's any way, I think, I don't know if anybody else would be confused, but for my clarification, I think just knowing what is the what is that in the narrative, that was just a question I had. Okay. What is the PA Safe Schools Act and how does that relax, re, uh, relate to Act 44? It doesn't have to be a dissertation, but just sure. maybe a notation because people are so focused on Act 44 right now that I just default thought that that was something that was required by that new law. Okay, so great. that would be helpful. Um, I also had another question in the policy itself. Um, when you're talking about authority in the second paragraph, I mean the second section, that statement to me didn't read as authority, giving anybody in particular authority. I could be wrong, but I was just wondering if in fact there's a miss there about um, designating authority in that particular statement. It says cooperation with law enforcement agencies is considered essential for protecting students and staff. I mean, yes, it is, but who, who has the authority, as we typically have in our policies, to make sure that such a climate um, and such an environment um, exists in our schools? Do you see what I'm saying? So I just don't think it's an authority statement. I don't think there's anything wrong with the statement. I would almost put it in the purpose section, but I don't really feel like it's an authority statement. Okay. Um, I don't know if changing that would be substantive or not, but I, I don't is, think this, so. this is the first time this is here, so we can make changes to this and move it and still move it forward to a first read. Okay. If, All if right. Terrific. Like. And the other question I had under delegation of responsibility is that... Um, it says that the MOU um, details the procedures for contacting law enforcement regarding reportable incidents that take place on school property. It didn't say off school property, and I was just wondering if there are, um, if, if there is um, a, a window for 
take contacting law enforcement as per the MOU for something that involves students that occurs off school property. Say they're at an off school event and something happens and you need to contact law enforcement. So I was just wondering if, if that um, inadvertently was too limiting with, um, relative to the scope of the MOU. Does that make sense? Yeah, we can certainly add that because the MOU uh, does cover events which take place on school property, but it also covers things like um, school-sponsored activities on or off campus, uh, on school vehicles. It, it, it covers those items as well, so we can add that. Okay. Um, and those were um, the only comments I had, and since I'm last to go, I think, unless anybody else, that triggered a thought well, for that, anybody that, else. That, did I have one question? Okay. I guess my question goes to, to the authority, because once we contact the superintendent, deems that the the police need to be contacted and they're contacted and then once or, or the or who, whomever from from our end of it yeah. and then once the police come in okay they they have they then have the authority correct and that's that's outlined in the MOU okay that once okay. the police come on scene they take control of the investigative piece mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of of any type of law enforcement investigation okay and at that point in time, the district's responsibilities are to facilitate the investigation, provide access to information, uh, sometimes get in contact with parents to keep parents informed of what is going on. But all decisions regarding um, whether a student's going to be taken into custody or who's going to be interviewed, right. all of that is handled by law enforcement. Exactly. And, and, and we are no, because that has happened before, and we've received many calls from many people. and once we bring in law enforcement they take over that's their jurisdiction then. correct okay and that's spelled out in here yep okay. all right terrific so i think one more thing oh, sure. one more. Oh, oh you know what i do have something but i don't want to uh, i'll talk to um ken uh, bachelor afterwards and the rest of you in executive session because it's more or less a safety type issue and and th there there's nothing in here that could provide um, easier access to our students if somebody get, is this discoverable can if you you can if we put this MOU into a policy then it's going to have to be up so everything that's in here is now going to be public it's a good question I'll let Ed yeah, sure, and, and Mr. Batchelor and I had this discussion the other day. Uh, there's nothing in this document that um, this is a model MOU that's developed by PDE. It's on their website, okay. and the only thing that we add to this is the name of the school district and the name of our administrators. There's nothing confidential about this document, okay. and there's nothing in here that would compromise the safety of a building, compromise the safety of a student, Fine. or anything like that. Okay. Yeah, I'm good then. That's good. Okay, great. Good question. And so I think this will go then in two weeks to the board for a first read, is what you're saying, with those changes. Do you just want to remove the authority section out of the policy and just have a purpose and then write into a delegation? There's nothing wrong with doing that. I, you know, I leave it to the administrative liaison and the, and the solicitor to decide what's best. Um, I don't know. I just didn't see that it, it probably can all the way be incorporated into a purpose. Okay. And the MOU itself sort of spells out the authority of each of each party. Sure. So I actually think that by simply delegating the responsibility to the superintendent or designee to enter into this MOU, mm -hmm. that kind of takes care of the okay. authority responsibility. Works so for me. Maybe we'll just delete that category. Okay. Terrific. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. So that is moving on to twenty five. Mm -hmm. If we just appreciate your indulgence and go back in the agenda I don't know what happened there to the second item which was policy 247 our anti hazing policy dr. Stevenson you got you all saw the synopsis of why we're reviewing this um, do you have anything to add to that dr. Stevenson um, I do not um, 247 is uh, being brought back um, for review um, with the recommendation that um, it is brought to the full board in April regular business meeting for second read Okay, so with that, do we have any questions from around the table for this next round um, for 247? Starting with Rachel. No, I'm good. You're good? Mm -hmm. Mrs. McMenamin? No, I'm good. Mrs. Solomon? I'm 
this time. Okay. I'm good. Mr. Madden, okay. I think there was just one typo that was brought to our attention in 247, and I can get that to you when I find it. I had it marked, and I'm, now I'm not sure exactly where it went, but I will find it and get it to you, if that's okay. It was an an instead of an a, and I think it was in 247, but I'll have to double check. So with that said, 247 is ready to go on to the business meeting in two weeks for a second read and adoption. And that will move us into the next policy on our agenda, which is policy 904, public attendance at school events. And you know what? Forgive me. Sorry, it's coming back. I don't know. Maybe I didn't have coffee today or something. It was 806 AR where there was an an instead of an a. That's why I couldn't find it marked. When we get to that, I'll tell you that one word typo that needs to be fixed. 247 was clean as a whistle and good to go. Yeah, yeah, so sorry about that. The oh, AR has got me confused. So policy 904, public attendance at school events. This is a policy you're all seeing for the first time. Um, you saw the rationale and the agenda about why we're looking at it. Uh, Dr. Stevenson, do you have anything to add to that? I, I don't other than just to say that this is right, um, would change the minimum language, as you can see in the red line, to be consistent with the uh, policies that we previously passed to include um, um, a consistent language. Okay, yes, like I had mentioned, there were a couple other policies that have been impacted by the changes we made to 222, our tobacco and electronic smoking policies. So just to make sure that all of that content is consistent across the board, this one is one of those that needed to have a few words inserted to it as well. So Rachel, do you have any feedback on this particular policy, 904? I do not. Mrs. McMenamin? Yes. Mrs. Solomon? Mr. Madden. It's related to it, but it's really the follow-up with the uh, signage. And that, that's just a question. We're going to have to change the, the signage that we have because if our policy changes and we don't have it on the sign as you're walking in to see a football game, you, you could be challenged by somebody and say, well, it's not posted there. So um, that would be something that... I, th I think you make a good point, um, and what I will do is I will consult with our Director of Operations, Mark Brooks, and the Superintendent to review our signage that may be impacted by not only that, but any language that we change. I think you make a good point as we look at policy, but it would be good to review with him any signage and what that language say across the board so we can review it and then consult with uh, Mr. Bachelor to, to move forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. You. That's all I have. Okay, terrific. And I just had two tiny little things. One was a typo, actually, on the first page of 904, the second paragraph from the bottom. I think there are just two periods there instead of one next to the word form. I'm looking at the clean 904 and the second to last paragraph, and the last word in that paragraph is form. Okay. All right. All right. And the other thing is on the last page, the back page of the policy. It's again that federal law citation where the numbers are reversed. Um, 20 USC 7181 is actually supposed to be 7118. Remember, we had to change that on all of our other policies related to this. So that's really 7118 instead of 7181. And I'll, I'll just that pesky I'll just, little. I'll just policy. comment because this is so uh, it, it's so it's so funny. But in the PSBA model policy, uh, seven one one eight and seven one eight one are both legal citations that that they reference. However, you're correct. Seven one one eight is the reference that should be referenced, and the seven one eight one does not need to be. But okay. I think that's what happened in the okay. model. They okay. used both of them. Okay. But we'll get that corrected. Okay. And you can call, give PSBA a call while you're at it. Thank you. Okay. Terrific. So this one will go for a first read in two weeks, 904. 
And that takes us, folks, to the very last item on our agenda, which is Administrative Regulation 806, Reporting Child Abuse. Again, this is not something that we need to approve as a part of our regular policy approval process, but as part of our protocols that we developed as a committee, any time that an administrative regulation is changed, our administrative liaison is bringing it to the committee so that we're aware that a regulation is being changed. And this is one of them, but I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Diazio or Dr. Stevenson to walk us through why the changes were needed. Sure. So <clears throat> when the Child Protective Services law was revised a couple years back to require clearances and things like that on a, um, every three years, uh, school districts were quick to uh, put together a policy on child abuse reporting and, and you know, the process that individuals need to go through to obtain clearances. Uh, since the time that uh, the law... The law has changed since the time that the policy and the AR were adopted. The big change is on page two of the AR, uh, the definition of child abuse has been expanded. You'll see previously there were nine items that constituted child abuse, and number 10 has been added. And that's a change to the statute um, and the definition of child abuse. So that's the real reason why the AR <clears throat> came under review and why we decided to take a look at it. You'll see a lot of other minor changes uh, throughout the rest of the AR, um, and most of those changes were simply to clean up the document a little bit, um, take out some, some language that didn't need to be in there, some definitions that really weren't necessary to interpreting the policy, uh, corrected some formatting issues, uh, nothing else major. The only, the only change in terms of why we brought this back was um, to add to the definition of child abuse, uh, and also uh, one other thing on page nine to add a foster parent as someone that's subject to mandating report mandated reporting. Those two items have been changed in the law. Okay, terrific. Thank you for the explanation. Let me go around the table and see if anybody has any questions. Rachel, Mrs. McMenamin, Lydia, Mr. Men. I actually do have one, and it's it. It serves, I think, sometimes a different population, but what happens when the student is no longer a child? What is the reporting requirements for that? Because we do have students who, who, who are over 18 years old in high school, and even in some other type of school settings, we have children that go up to 21. So, uh, and this is a question that I'm throwing out to you. We have the child abuse reporting, what happens to the students that are still here and they're no longer considered a child, they're considered an adult, what do we do then? Sure. So, so technically, I mean, the law defines a child as a student under 18. So uh, once, once a student is 18, uh, they're no longer uh, mandated reporters, are no longer mandated to report. Does it mean that they can't report? Okay. Um, th what would be in place then? Uh, and it sort of relates to policy 225, which we talked about uh, just a few moments ago. Many of the types of things that constitute uh, child abuse are also criminal in nature, obviously. So uh, sexual assault, uh, indecent exposure, inappropriate contact, um, those things are still crimes. And when they take place on school property, we still report them to law enforcement. Um, but it, it doesn't go through the Children and Youth Agency right, right, okay. because the student is over 18. This is related to the reporting agency that we're required to report to. Correct. Okay. Correct. And then our, within our handbook or our, um, within our policy some places, is there a stipulation of what you do after when, when it becomes a, a, an adult? I mean, when when do, a student's do, no longer 18, yeah, yeah. The, the policy wouldn't apply, but that's when the other, that's when 225 would. would kick in if there was something that took place on school property. And just because uh, the law doesn't mandate a report, mm -hmm. if something happens, if a student says something, uh, that can still be reported. And my, my sense would be that many times it, it still would be. Okay. I just want to make sure we have our guidelines in place because it, we have teachers who it could be a gray area and say, if this person, if this was a uh, child, I'd have to report it. Okay, if it's not a child, 
the way I look at it, which is my own personal view, the way I look at it is it should be reported to mm -hmm. somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's if I'm a teacher, it should be reported to my supervisor, and that should be noted uh, myself. And um, I think that might be something that we look into later when we look visit that policy, because I still believe that when there's a violation that um, we need to track it, we need to know what's actually happening, and that gives our the service, uh, I guess we, uh, the programs that we offer here, we have a lot of programs that we can then put in place to help the, the students, is kind of what I'm saying. So if it's reported, it doesn't mean it's going to go to the police department, it means it's, it's reported internally to your supervisor. That person in turn would then report it to um, the right person, the counselor, maybe a mental health provider, maybe whomever. Like for instance, if I'm a teacher and I see a student that is having a particularly bad day, I report that to the counselor. That's basically what you do. Um, and, I, and we probably do that now. I just think it's great to have guidance someplace for new teachers to look at it and see what we have to do. But we can talk about that later. Yeah, but you're uh, you're I think confusing two different topics because oh, it's a different topic. No, no, child I'm, abuse. I'm, I'm not confusing okay. two different topics. I mean, what? kid having a bad day is something you want to take. Okay, no, that's not what. No, that's yeah. not what I'm saying. Okay, children need supports, and sometimes they do something that triggers it. And what I'm saying is, if they're over 18, okay, we it's not related to this policy, but we have in place protocols and procedures that we follow. That's all. We already have that stuff in place. I'm just saying that it just struck me as being odd that we no longer have to report it or there's no agency that we have to report it once the, ch the child turns 18. That's all. Well, but so if it's abuse, you do still need to report it. Not the child, not, not to this agency though. Well, no, it doesn't go to children and youth, but it, you still report it. So, but that's not somebody having a bad day. That's no, no, no. It's, it's a actual bad day, abuse. Though, it's, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, he, no, he's not. He's no, not uh, talking. Do you understand yeah. kind of where yeah. I'm coming from? Yeah, yeah. 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 that's all. It's Chuck, nothing. Chuck's talking this, about I'm in the scheme of, a, yeah. of abuse, yeah. and just for the that you, subset you, of students in our district who are older than 18 and are not. Um, covered under this policy, is there something in place to take care still of that subset of yes, so. under who would endure similar things yeah. but are not protect, part of this mm -hmm. policy? Mm -hmm. So, and, and one other thing to keep in mind is that all staff members' uh, training is required. Child abuse uh, professional development is required. Uh, I believe it's five hours every three years that that staff have to undergo. Um, I forget if it's five under five hours every three years or three hours every five years. I think it's uh, five hours every three years um, of training. So that that would make that that's the way that new staff would be six hours. She um, remembers six hours. Okay, uh, so that's how your new staff would be mm -hmm. trained. And again, my sense would be that the pr protocol that would be followed for a student that was over eighteen is that you would contact law enforcement. That would be my you would, we guess. Would. Yeah. yeah. Well, you would contact your supervisor and this correct because be, and, and I, yes. I want to be clear on this because as a teacher if I was to contact the police without notifying my supervisor that is a problem I'm not sure your mic is on but it's on I may not want it to be on. Oh, okay right but that but oh. that is but that is something that has with a lot of this what what changed a couple of years ago, you know, with the mandated reporter and the child abuse is that structure of the responsibility of the teacher did change, and that the teacher, as a mandated reporter, so when we're talking about 1800, are responsible to call, and then we have a policy. You have to let your principal know as well. Um, you have to go through that chain of command as well. Um, same thing goes if a teacher's if, if the student is 18. Yes, they should be sharing with their supervisor right. all that is going on as well. And we have those those pieces in place to make sure. Yep. Okay. And so to summarize, I just wanted this on this AR. I did find the typo. Okay. So if you go to page five, um, and you look at the top, it is the fourth item down. That number four says an community 
or social outreach program. So if you could just change that to a community or social outreach program, that would be much appreciated. Mm -hmm. we, we put that in there just to see if you would find it, Amy. Oh, yeah. Well, how much of a wager did you put on that? I want to know. <laughs> so, all right. And just to recap. We covered a lot today, and we did it pretty efficiently, I think. So 239 is coming back for a first read next month. 247 is going for um, a second, second read. 904 is going for a first read. 225 is going for a first read. And the administrative 806 administrative regulation can go up on the website as soon as those little things are fixed in there, right? Okay. Well, with that, we will entertain any new business. Does anybody have any? No? Okay. Does any, uh, is there any public comment out there? No. Hello, Dr. Winters. Good afternoon. No, yeah. we, it, now it's on. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Roberta Winters, back Happy again. <laughs> <laughs> Happy midnight. You like that, right? Um, what I wanted to check with you about is I know I'm pleased you're looking at things like the homework policy and, and things like that. And I think one of the things as you look at that, and not that it's connected to abuse, but from my experience, many times when you're looking at homework situations, it can you, lead to unfortunate disciplinary actions both at home and at school. And I think one of the things that I can recall clearly from my teaching experience is many times students who don't do their homework are kept in from recess. And I think given what we know about the need for exercise and, and outlets for students with a lot of energy, I think sometimes we do things that are counterproductive. So I hope when you look at the homework policy, we'll also look at the kinds of remediation that might be appropriate or perhaps looking at options for students who cannot complete that homework for a variety of reasons because many times it's been my experience as we talked about diversity and inclusion and all those things there's a variety of reasons that we don't always think about as teachers who are dealing with 25 kids and we have policies to follow and expectations to be met so I think it's it's a tough balancing act in many occasions but please I'm just asking you to consider homework think about consequences for unfinished homework or undone homework or patterns of what would some people would call irresponsible behavior, which may, may, many times isn't at the fault of a child. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll conclude our policy meeting for this evening. <laughs>